What's up, everybody? I told you we're going to have a surprise today. This is a surprise. Uh, we're over in Gettysburg. We're dodging the rain, uh, which we weren't expecting it to last this long. We wanted to go live earlier, but uh, the weather has been not nice to us for a little while. So we went and grabbed a cup of coffee from 82 Cafe, helping out with small business. And we are here in the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. And we are in a different part of the cemetery than a lot of people actually come over to and visit and uh, got someone here to talk to us about people who are buried here in this section of the cemetery and I think you're gonna get a lot out of this as I put in the description we're gonna talk about men who were in the First World War who are buried just off to the side of the cemetery and uh, what we'll do then is we'll go through here and uh, talk to you about certain burials and then I'll show you where you can find this plot Here's the National Cemetery. You know how I like to do a 360 view of what's around so you can find it. We'll do that as well. Uh, but without further ado, guys, I want to bring on uh, my good friend, James Taub. And uh, we're going to keep socially distanced, so I'm going to switch with him. He's behind the camera. And he's going to lead us through. And we're going to go mobile here in a few minutes and go from different stones to different stones and burials. So, James, come on in, buddy. This was a very nice transition. Yeah, well, After when you smooth. go back and edit it, you should do like star effects. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like a nice side sweep. But yeah. um, hey, everybody! Um, for those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is James Taub. Uh, I'm a historian uh, who focuses primarily on the First World War, and it's great to be back here working with John um, to help bring First World War history and kind of combine it with Civil War history. Because as you may be aware, we're currently standing in Gettysburg uh, National Military Cemetery, part of the overall Gettysburg National Military Park just to kind of give you the bearings of where we are, and we'll have the camera moving around. Um, we are just to the northwest of the Soldiers uh, and Sailors Monument, just outside of the circle of the many graves that uh, are here of the Federal Soldiers and a few scattered Confederates uh, from the Battle of Gettysburg. But we're at a section of the cemetery that I think is one of the more interesting sections for me personally as a First World War historian. There are a number of First World War burials here at Gettysburg National Cemetery. Uh, you have plenty of veterans who died later on in the 50s and the 70s. But here in particular with this section, uh, which is just behind Cemetery Hill itself, are some really interesting folks that I think we should highlight more. And I'm going to highlight them not only through some of their individual stories, but what I'd like to take the opportunity today is to show you what you can learn from a First World War gravestone and what to look for to identify the gravestone of an American serviceman, servicewoman who served in the First World War. So with that, I think we're going to take the interesting time to try and get the camera mobile. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go mobile stay here. Stay socially distanced. And there if you go. have any questions throughout any of this, feel free to uh, comment in the comment thread here and uh, we'll be certain to answer them. If I can't, I'm sure John can. But the, the thing that I want to highlight here is you're primarily going to see two different types of headstones for First World War veterans in the United States. Now, when a soldier was killed or died on active service during the First World War, his family was given the option of uh, either having the body remain in one of the centralized American cemeteries in France or Flanders, biggest one being Meuse Argonne, um, Saint Michiel is another one in Tiacour. They were also given the option of bringing the body back to the United States. And if they chose that option, they could either have the body uh, rest in a military national cemetery. Each state has one or two options. Gettysburg is one of the options for the state of Pennsylvania or they could have the body taken to a, uh, their family plot in a family cemetery. With those who came back to the United States as well, they were given the option of either receiving a military headstone or uh, receiving a headstone that the family themselves paid for. And we're gonna see different options. One sort of outlier of this are soldiers who died on service during the First World War and uh, were buried almost immediately. Now, with Gettysburg being a First World War camp in 1917, you had the infantry encampment here, four regiments of infantry are training. They go off and become primarily members of the 4th as well as the 5th Division. Uh, and then in 1918, you have the Tank Corps training. You're going to see some soldiers who are buried here who die as a result of their service here and remain under headstones that actually predate the Civil War. One of the examples that I'm going to point out here is Samuel Getman. Getman served in the 60th Infantry. Now he's a really interesting character because he was an immigrant, spoke almost no English, uh, and when he was drafted in the army, obviously did not have a very good time of it. 
was complaining about some of the instances of service and eventually unfortunately committed suicide. No one really knew that he had an issue, no one really knew that uh, he was having such a rough time of it simply because of language issues. So he's now buried here at Gettysburg National Military Cemetery under what's actually a Civil War or Spanish American headstone. And you get the very base amount of information. They actually, in fact, still have the war listed incorrectly. He was a, he, while well, he served briefly in the Spanish American War, he also should have First World War as uh, under the service, or World War I, as you'd say. So that's one of the first types of headstones you would see with, unfortunately, quite a sad story. What we're gonna move over to now, I think, is one that really kind of illuminates. Now these civilian, these, these private purchase headstones sometimes tell you much more of a story. And uh, one I'm going to point out here is James Millage. James is a local guy here in Gettysburg. So as you can see, this is not the same sort of headstone, but James served as a private in Company K of the 167th Infantry, the 42nd Rainbow Division. Uh, that was the nickname given to them. Most famously, the 42nd also included units like the Fighting 69th, the 165th Infantry. But it also adds a bit more. He was an Italian immigrant born in Salerno, Italy, and he was killed in action in the Chateau Thierry sector, July 26, 1918. So they give quite a bit of information. And from that, we can start to draw what might have been the circumstances of his death as someone who wants to go off and explore a little bit more about him. 42nd Division, alongside several other U.S. divisions, are engaged in the Second Battle of the Marne around the area of Chateau Thierry. And during this point in late July, they're actually part of a general counterattack to drive the Germans back after their large spring offensives. And they're going to be pushing north and eastwards uh, to drive the Germans sort of towards those initial points around the town of Soissons around um, and out of the Marne River Valley. So this is going to be the area that he's killed in. So we know that although it says the Chateau Thierry sector, today we could accurately say it's part of the Second Battle of the Marne, part of the Wazan Offensive. So if you were to look up where Company K of the 167th Infantry was on that day, you could find out what happened to Private Millage. He was uh, obviously uh, fairly loved and his family listed um, a small message here just for them. And that's one of the more personal things you can get off of one of these individual gravestones. Probably the most common one you'll see is just a general military gravestone with almost no information. I'm going to be going over here to see if we can find him again. Here he is. So, William Myers. Now, William is an interesting guy. He is from York, Pennsylvania. He enlists in the Army in Colorado when war breaks out, and he's assigned to the 10th Field Artillery. A 10th Field Artillery, part of the 3rd Division. They uh, serve alongside the 76th Field Artillery and the 18th Field Artillery, and they become known as the Rock of the Marne. They're one of the more elite divisions of the American Expeditionary Forces. They get that nickname from uh, the initial stopping of the German assault along the Marne River Valley at the end of May, beginning of June 1918. They then take part in the General Allied Counteroffensive, which I mentioned earlier, and uh, Myers is killed on the 15th of July, I believe? Mm -hmm. Yep, 15th of July, 1918. That is a pretty hectic time for the 3rd Division, and that's illustrated as well by another grave, another civilian grave we have over here, uh, Mr. Feldman, William Feldman, also part of the 18th Field Artillery. He was part of the Headquarters Company, or and part of the 3rd Division, serving in the 18th Field Artillery, excuse me. So these guys are serving almost next to each other, killed almost on the same day. Oh, sorry, this one is October 1917. But the, fit, the July 15th death is, the, is particularly interesting for me, William Myers. That bombardment that he's killed in as a member of the 3rd Field Artillery Brigade is mentioned by my great uncle, who was also serving alongside William Hartman uh, Feltman in the uh, 3rd Division's Field Artillery. My great great uncle was in Battery A of the 18th Field Artillery. So right next to uh, where Feldman would have been. Uh, and on October 17th, he also describes the bombardment coming in, uh, actually hitting uh, friendly headquarters. It's on that day that he mentions the French liaison, liaison officer, Lieutenant Dorant, is killed by a shell. Um, also a Lieutenant uh, Edwards, Frank Trevenian Edwards, is mortally wounded by a shell on this day. Uh, so 
it's interesting for me, obviously we're in a small corner of South Central Pennsylvania here, that you're able to connect these small stories. And I think one of the important things to take away from this as we just did a very cursory look at the history of uh, First World War graves and of First World War veterans who rest in the United States is the stories you can learn from these. All the basic information that I've got on Feldman and on William Myers are just from cursory internet searches. I know personally as someone who focuses heavily on the third division what was going on for these two men uh, on those days. Uh, and if you get someone here who might be more of an expert on another division, they might be able to illuminate more on some of the other soldiers who rest here. We have soldiers from the 28th Division, the private of the 111th Infantry over there, uh, who's killed uh, probably around Tia Corps. Um, but I think that uh, this really should encourage people when they come to cemeteries like Gettysburg and they see the non-Civil War graves or the Civil War graves, to take the opportunity to explore and learn a little bit more of that, this, these people. This is a very base amount of information. You, you really won't see much more on most of these, on these graves. Um, Private of the 42nd was a rare example. But just from this basic amount of information, as historians, we can draw a whole life story. We'll be able to go and pull uh, Feldman's burial file, see the exact wound which killed him, We'll be able to look at unit war diaries. We go to National Archives when they reopen after all of this. And we'll be able to explore a little bit more. So please, make sure you visit your local cemeteries as well as your local outside areas and try to connect with history in one way or another, whether it be through visiting graves and then going home, researching the men and women who you uh, saw, learning a little bit more about them, or just by exploring the land they st uh, stood on. Obviously, these guys are primarily local guys. So for someone living in Gettysburg, not only would this be yet another cool history story they can have about their local area, but it's that other connection. And if you live in Virginia, try to get to the cemetery at Fort Lee, uh, Camp Lee. If you, uh, you know, live in Michigan, uh, make sure to get to the cemetery um, at Fort Custer. So there's, there's, there's plenty of different uh, areas you can explore here. And I don't know if we have any questions. If not, I've kind of rambled incoherently, <laughs> which is my mainstay. It's kind of my trademark. Uh, Kelly Gates, thank you for your question. She asked where they buried by the division that they were uh, with, and I think that's actually a very important question to ask with the Camp Colt burials. Yeah, up the way, so we can walk yeah, up that way, Kelly, that and way. show you those because these men would have been buried by comrades or <laughs> or uh, had their ceremony with yeah. comrades, right, James? So uh, if you were killed, let's say one of these men who was killed in the front in France. You would be buried either immediately by your comrades. You see plenty of pictures if you scroll through the National Archives of the battlefields of just small mounds of dirt with rifles and bayonets uh, stuck out of them to mark where a uh, soldier had fallen. Afterwards, they brought through units of the Quartermaster Corps, which are called Graves Registration Units. And they would accumulate the war dead into small cemeteries scattered throughout all the battlefields. And then after the war, the American Battlefield Monuments Commission is formed, and they congregate all the dead into these major American cemeteries, which still exist today for both world wars. In the 1920s, they start to give families the uh, option of bringing those men back, right? And so when they come back, they'll be brought back, paid for by the military, paid for with taxpayer dollars. And basically, the military's job was to get that body either to in the ground with military honors in a federal cemetery, or to the local train station for the family to pick up and take to a private cemetery. So yeah, they would be buried by their comrades or by other soldiers in the army, and then they would be getting full honors as they came back um, to the United States, and then would be buried with full honors or through whatever the family requested. Mm -hmm. So that is a really good question. Um, we were gonna point out the paint for burials. As we mentioned, Camp Colt was also used as, uh, Camp Colt in 1918 was the training ground for the tank corps famously used, um, run by uh, a Captain Eisenhower, who some of you may have heard of. Um, and these are three of the dead from, from the tank corps. Um, we're doing a little bit more research on them. I know there are folks out there who know exactly what happened to these guys. I believe one or two of them are casualties from the infamous Spanish flu. Um, but uh, as you can see, these are all private markers. These were all uh, laid out by the family. Um, it could be that they would have been buried under regular markers and the family came back after the war. Obviously, you can see some of these are newer. So um, there, there's a wide range of options and it's, it's 
quite dissimilar from, say, those who were killed here at the Battle of Gettysburg, who are all buried under one uh, centralized marker. But it's, uh, you know, another interesting aspect of the study, and you can start to see the history of Gettysburg during the First World War through some of these burials. You see the men from the community who went off and fought on the Western Front, were killed there, or those who came home and are buried in the veterans uh, section over there, or you also can see the section of men here uh, who were who died serving here in training or helping other soldiers get ready to go overseas and fight. Obviously, World War One is the last war where more people die of disease than of combat wounds in the United States, and that's predominantly because of the Spanish flu, which claimed claimed an insane amount of lives. Um, and you'll start to see that uh, reflected in in the graves here as well. Hmm. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you, Kelly, for that. Uh, Tyler Tierney asks, are the bodies actually in the ground here? Uh, at those like those locations yes. where they're killed in the maybe the Argonne yeah. or somewhere else so, are they actually here yeah. or uh, he also says I know that Commonwealth soldiers were never repatriated and are still in France yeah. and Belgium the United States I'm gonna answer the second part of that question uh, to start off the United States had a very different approach to war dead than the Commonwealth nations um, the Commonwealth up until the Falklands War as as David's pointed out doesn't uh, repatriate at all. There is zero of that done. You have to have died in the United Kingdom, say if you're a soldier of the United Kingdom, to be buried in the United Kingdom. Um, that's mainly for several reasons. Uh, there's the price of getting all those guys back. There's um, the issue of uh, misplaced identities with bodies, which is something that comes up in the United States. There's a great book whose name I'm totally blanking on, but it was written by a PhD uh, student at George Mason University, and it's all about the repatriation of US war dead in World War I, and the letters that these families were sending to the war office, basically saying, this isn't the body. I don't believe you. Um, it, it, it's it, it, completely insane. The reason the US actually does it was kind of on a fluke. The Secretary of War, Newton Baker, randomly promised that he would do it to someone in private conversation and it was picked up by a newspaper. And then they're like, well, we can't go back on this now. So that's why the US is actually repatriating. Um, there's the experience of the American Civil War, which for I'm sure you have several experts on that uh, watching. Um, obviously the amount of loss of the US Civil War mandated the creation of national cemeteries and really changed the view of death and combat and death and military service in the United States. For Britain, they don't really have the citizen service aspect of their military, what we think of it as the citizen soldier in the United States, leaving your farm, going fighting, coming back to it after the war. Britain doesn't see that until the First World War. So they're going through the same process in terms of war and memory at the end of the First World War that most Americans had at the end of the Civil War. So um, there is sort of a change of ideas there and, and you do start to see that moving. In, in terms of your first part of your question, are these actually the remains? As far as we're aware, yes, these are the remains. Uh, you will see in many cemeteries across the U.S. Uh, the perfect example of this is Old Chapel Cemetery, just south of Middleburg, Virginia, which I visited with Mosby Heritage Association last summer. Um, there are several markers there that will say, in memory of. And if you hop on the American Battlefield Monument Commission website, if you just Google American Battlefield Monuments Commission, uh, you can then look through the database and see who is, if they're in memory of here in the United States, where in France or Flanders are they buried? Because um, they will be at one of the uh, American cemeteries on the Western Front, of which I believe there are nine First World War cemeteries. The other thing you'll see that's a major difference between the U.S. and Commonwealth is uh, around half of all British and Dominion war dead are missing. The U.S. doesn't have that same percentage. We obviously have quite a number of missing soldiers, but it's nowhere near the percentage of, say, Britain, France, or Germany, mainly because the warfare we were engaged in in uh, the spring to the fall of 1918 didn't have that same destructive tendency on the landscape and uh, the same amount of concentrated artillery in centralized areas. Hmm. Uh, that's just an awesome thing to talk about, James. I really appreciate you doing that. And what we're going to do is we're going to put this thing back on the tripod as best we can. And we're going to do a 360, show people where they can actually find this section in the cemetery. Yeah. Because so many people walk right past it, don't even know it's here. Yeah. So I'm going to try my best to lock this thing back into place. And we will show you where if you, to... Uh, if you need the important Gettysburg locations, Cemetery Hill is right there. Yeah. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument is right there. So therefore, Rita's 
<laughs> yes. There. Don't forget about Rita's. Uh, Not a sponsor today, though. Not a sponsor. No. And if I could lock us in place, we I would believe be on this is the second or third video where I've tried to get you a Rita sponsorship. I appreciate that. No problem. I mean, I'm working. I'm just going to spin best. you around. I can't get okay. you locked in. So. But yeah, as show you can see, we are, I believe Jim. we're behind. I believe this is New York uh, for the Civil War dead. Um, it might be Pennsylvania. It's one of the two big ones. But you've got the Soldiers and Sailors Monument here, the center of the Civil War part of the National Cemetery. Um, and as you would, uh, then you've got, of course, Evergreen behind the fence just back there. Then as you traverse to the right, we're starting to face south towards the rest of the National Cemetery, um, down towards Cemetery Ridge itself. So this is just past the actual entrance if you're coming off of, um, believe, uh, what's the street that runs behind Cemetery Hill? Baltimore. Baltimore Street, yes. yeah. Oh man, I haven't played Sid Meier's Gettysburg in so long, so I've forgotten my Gettysburg geography. This is how we learned geography. This is Sid it. Meyer's this is how Gettysburg. I learned the, the Civil War Order battle at Gettysburg. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, as we come back to the section we were discussing today, which I hope to we'll be able to discuss some more about and illustrate some more of these stories, um, just beyond the trees over here is the Reynolds Monument and the main entrance to the cemetery from the north over there. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, central First World War burial ground directly behind where John is now. Behind a set of trees is where the veterans of the First World War are. Men who survived the war or were wounded um, and chose to be buried under military headstones in the National Cemetery. So there's a wide range of stories. You don't have to have been killed or died because of service in the First World War to have a cool interesting story that you can illuminate through one of these headstones. Um, so with that, I mean, just make sure you start to do some research on these folks or continue if you already have because they all have very interesting stories. Today we met two immigrants, one from Italy who served and was killed with the 42nd Division, one who died in service here at Gettysburg, and we've met a bunch of local people. It doesn't have to be a Gettysburg National Cemetery for it to have cool local stories for you to explore and, and learn more about your history and your towns. So. Thank you, James. Really appreciate that, man. Yeah. Hey, uh, we'll be back in a little bit. We're going to do some more live streaming, and uh, we're going to have to pick a spot. I don't yeah. know where we're going to go. Uh, the rain kind of yeah. threw us off, but we'll... Give us recommendations. Yes, yeah. yes. Let us know in the comments, but we'll, we'll see what we can do, guys. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Really appreciate your comments and questions. We'll be back with you in a little bit.